And our next speaker, Pavi Pondarenkin, is basically the TI-84 of blockchain. She spent the last year getting crazy familiar with the inner workings of stacks and how fee estimates and mempools influence one another. I'm talking like Gandalf tearing through scrolls in the basement of Minas Tirith. She has done the hard work and the research. Let's welcome Pavi down to the stage for a deep dive on fee markets, mempools, and cost estimations on stacks. Okay. okay. Hello? Cool. Okay, uh, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about smart contract costs as well as transaction fees. So a little bit about me. My name is Pavitra, and I'm a distributed systems engineer at Hero, as well as a core developer on the Stacks protocol. So in this talk, I'll be covering two different projects we executed at Hero. The first project I'll be talking about is the Clarity Cost Benchmarking Project. In this project, we benchmarked accurate runtime costs for operations in the smart contracting language Clarity. This is important because it affected the assessed cost of transactions on the blockchain. And by the end of this talk, you'll understand how this work stream increased the stack's network throughput overall. The second project I'll be talking about is the fee estimator project. In this project, we analyze transaction data in recent blocks in order to come up with averages for fee rates. Fee rates is basically just the amount of fee you pay per unit of a transaction size. This is important now because users and developers alike can now leverage the fee estimator endpoint that we created at Hero to price their tra transaction fees competitively. Diving into the first project, computing accurate runtime costs for clarity. Let's understand a little bit more about how smart contract costs work. So first, Stacks blocks bundle transactions. So there's many different types of transactions on the Stacks blockchain, right? You can transfer STX from one user to another. You can publish your smart contract. You can call a function a small contract. So as I said, some, tra some transactions invoke smart contract methods. Evaluating these smart contract methods requires executing operations on the node. Each operation has an associated computational cost, and the node is keeping track of this in the background as it's packaging blocks. Cost functions are the concept that we use in the node in order to define the assessed costs of each operation. More importantly, the sum of all costs in the block have to be less than the network block cost limit. And this limit exists for a very good reason. We want to make sure that all blocks are processable in a timely manner. That's why it's essential for nodes to keep track of the costs of the transactions that it's including. Let's understand a bit more about cost functions. The purpose of cost functions, as I already said, is to compute the approximate cost of executing clarity code. Each cost function corresponds to some operation. Some native clarity functions correspond one-to-one -to, -one to cost functions. For example, the native clarity functions append and concat each have an associated cost function. A cost function basically outputs five different values. First, it outputs runtime. You can think of runtime as the compute that a certain operation takes. It also contains read count, read length, write count, and write length. You can think of these last four values as the cost of various database operations that the node has to execute. These cost functions for each of these five values correspond to some simple arithmetic expression. Some cost functions are constant. You can imagine some uh, clarity functions might do a fixed number of database reads. In that case, the cost function for read count might just be the number four. Other cost functions are dependent on input size. You can imagine there are certain clarity operations that take in lists. So the actual amount of time it would take to execute that operation would be dependent on the size of the list. In that case, the cost function might take a linear form. It might look like 5n plus 23, where n is the size of the list that you input. So all of these cost functions and the constants that are associated with them are basically stored in a clarity contract. 
It's stored in a contract called cost.clary. This contract is initialized in the genesis block, right? So the node starts up, it initializes the contract, and then when it's executing transactions, it refers back to this contract in order to compute costs accurately. Now let's talk a little bit more about our specific project. So our goal is that we wanted to obtain more accurate constants for runtime cost functions than the version that was released with the Stacks 2.0 launch, cost.clare. So our approach was to isolate and benchmark each clarity operation. To do so, we use the statistics-driven benchmarking library criterion, which is implemented in Rust. Many operations correspond to native clarity functions, which is what I already said before. For these, it was a simple approach. We generated a code snippet that called that clarity function, and then we executed the code and we benchmarked the result. Let me take you through what it looks like to benchmark a specific clarity function. So I'll tell you what we did for the clarity function and. The and function is variadic. That means it can take any number of inputs. Here's an example of how you might call the and function in the clarity language. So here, and is called with two different inputs, true and false. However, it can take any number. As you can imagine, the cost of executing and is dependent on how many arguments you actually provide it. So for example, if you have 100 trues um, and then a false, that would cost more than executing this line of code. So the runtime cost function for n takes a linear form, mn plus b, where n is the number of arguments you supply the function. For our project, we wanted to figure out what m and b are as accurately as we could. To do so, we had to collect runtime data for various input sizes, so different numbers of arguments. So we collected data for 1, 2, 8, 16, provided those arguments to n, saw how much they actually took when we ran them. So for input size 4, this is what our generated code snippet might look like. So you might be wondering, why does every line look the same? Three trues and a false. For some of our benchmarks, we had to limit the randomness of the inputs in order to make sure that we were benchmarking the worst case, which is what we wanted to capture. In addition, you might notice that we called it multiple times, um, and the reason we did that is to offset the startup costs of running Clarity code through the Clarity virtual machine. So later on, once we got our runtime numbers, we scaled it back down, depending on how many times we invoked the function. Finally, we got our results. So we plotted the benchmarking results. On the x-axis, you can see the input size. The input size is the number of arguments we supplied to the end function for that specific benchmark. On the y-axis, that's our runtime. That's how much time it took to execute this clarity code snippet. So what we did is once we had our results, we plotted a line of best fit using linear regression, which is a simple technique. The line of best fit has constants m and b. So just by knowing the equation of this line, we are able to find the constants that we were trying to get in the first place. We stored all of these cost function constants in a new boot contract, costs two. This boot contract was launched in Stacks 2.05, and now the node uses these updated constants in order to compute costs. Let's talk a little bit about how the actual community was impacted by this work stream. So this work stream led to more accurate and mostly smaller cost function constants. Because the cost function constants were mostly smaller, miners were able to now package more transactions in per block. So we were able to increase the throughput per block through this effort. And so increasing the throughput per block means one natural thing, and it means that we were able to increase the network throughput overall, which was a huge win for us um, in the Stacks 2.5 release of the blockchain. Now, moving on, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about another project that we executed at Hero, the fee estimation work. Let's go over some background terminology so we can all be on the same page. Transaction fee. A transaction fee is the amount of SDX that a user sends along with a transaction in order to incentivize miners to process and pick up their transaction. The transaction cost is the assessed computational cost of running that transaction. 
That's what we talked about in the previous section of the presentation. So the transaction cost basically means the runtime, read length, read count, write length, write count of an operation. The transaction size is distinct from the transaction cost, although it seems similar. It's basically a mathematical combination of the transaction cost, which includes all those five parameters, as well as the transaction length in bytes. So it's a single scalar value. The fee rate, we compute that by taking the transaction fee and dividing it by the transaction's size. So the output is the fee per unit of a transaction size. Let's understand a little bit more about fee markets in the blockchain. Fee markets naturally emerge in healthy blockchain networks due to the demand for block space. Transaction fees are essential in the blockchain. One, they incentivize miners to process transactions. Two, they lower the incidence of spam transactions on the network. So, in a blockchain with a fee market, if you pay a higher fee rate along with your transaction, you have a better likelihood of inclusion in an upcoming block. This is good for urgent use cases. Likewise, if you pay a lower fee rate, you have a lower likelihood of inclusion in an upcoming block. It's good for a less urgent use case, and it's probably good if you're willing to ride the highs and the lows of the fee market and pay a lower rate for that. Now let's talk a little bit about the fee estimation endpoint. You guys will be able to understand why we need this because we now understand what the fee market is. The users need to understand what a high or a low fee rate is at a specific time in order to be able to send both a competitive and an informed transaction fee along with their transaction. The solution for this is to build a fee estimator. What the fee estimator does is it analyzes recent transaction data. Based on this recent transaction data and looking at what users have paid recently per unit of their transaction size, the node then computes a low, medium, and high fee rate estimate. The low, medium, and high fee rate estimate correspond to the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile of recent fee rates that were paid. Then, based on their use case, the users can then select whether or not they want the low, medium, or high fee rate estimate for, to send their transaction. Under the hood, let's understand how the fee estimator actually works. So when a block is mined, the fee estimator receives a receipt of the block. This receipt contains a list of transactions that was actually included in the block. The metadata associated with each transaction basically also includes the transaction fee, as well as the computational cost of executing that transaction. So, the so now the miner has all that data. To actually compute the fee rate estimates, the node first computes the fee rate of every transaction in the block using the metadata that I just described. It fills the empty block space with a minimum fee rate transaction. This is done in order to make sure that like, a block that's just half full doesn't outrageously impact the fee rate estimates. We want to account for the actual lack of demand by filling up that, the rest of that block space. The fee rates are also then weighted by overall transaction size. What this means is that a heavier transaction has a greater chance of impacting the average fee rate than a smaller transaction. Then, after all this, the node computes the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile of fee rates. If a user wants to accurately price their transaction fee, they can request a fee rate estimate from an endpoint that we have on the Hero API. The node then returns an average fee rate estimate based on whether the user requested the low, medium, or high fee rate estimate. Another important note is that the node returns a fuzzed estimate. For example, let's say the actual fee rate estimate was 100. The node might return 100.01 or 99.99. The reason for this is to prevent the network from converging on a single fee rate. In times of high demand, a user that uses a transaction fee that was fuzzed upwards will have a greater chance of their transaction being included. Thus, in times of higher demand, the transaction fee rate average will naturally go up. As demand then lowers, a uh, fee rate that was fuzzed lower or higher has an equal chance of being included, and that will naturally bring the fee rates down again. 
Let's talk about how someone might use the fee estimation feature. First, they would understand the urgency of a given use case. Then, based on the understanding, a user or a developer can select the 5th, 50th, or 95th percentile fee rate estimate. Then, they can just pay their appropriate fee for their desired confirmation time. Here's a summary of what we talked about today. First, I went over the Clarity Cost Benchmarking Project. This yielded more accurate and mostly smaller costs for Clarity operations. What this means is that this increased network throughput from lower costs. Next, I discussed the fee estimator endpoint. Now, users and developers can leverage that in order to make more informed and competitive transaction fee pricing. For more information, you guys can check out my articles in the blog, so I went more into detail on both of these work streams, and I have another interesting article too, and you can follow me on Twitter. That's it. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. Yeah.